All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I know most of you guys are going to be still asleep, but a couple of you are up and rolling because that phone started ringing about 6 a.m. So this is that early morning sleepy look, but I still got you. I promise you. We've got three things on the agenda for this particular talk. So if you are pouring and listening at a later time, um, let me know your opinion. I love when I get those um, messages from after the video being filmed because those are actually some of the most reflective messages that I end up getting. And of course, if I catch you in the moment, be sure to let me know if you have any questions, comments, or if there's anything I've said that wasn't really clear. So first things first, thank you to everybody for the congratulations, guys. Um, this past weekend has been a real push because the soft lunch for um, my location down in Katy, Texas was actually moved up by a week and a half, which I was thinking maybe it was just me that was rushing to the end, but we were supposed to open on the 17th. We get an email on June 30th that says we're going to do a soft lunch on July 4th. And so it was a mad dash, just trying to get everything done, all the products poured, labeled. And you know how you think you're done? You've checked off all your boxes and then you get a phone call that says, hey, you, you forgot something really important. And so I'm going to go through those steps too. I've had a lot of questions over the weekend um, about the month of July. So if you notice the title, that description, talking about candle business in July, and you know it's important if I had to write it down, prepping for the fall, and then of course, business confidence. And when it comes to business confidence, I really want to make sure we take a second and we talk about the bug of the relaunch, because I've seen a lot of people who are relaunching. I have some people that are on their fourth, fifth, sixth relaunch. I want y'all to be careful about the way you use that word because a relaunch and a rebrand is a huge, huge thing for a small business. And some of you who are beginning and you start out really strong, you slow down a little bit and then, or you will have to step back and take a break. And you feel as though once it's time for you to step back out, it's going to require a complete relaunch of your business. And that's not always the case. So we'll get to that one as well. But um, let's start first and foremost with the month of July, because we've talked about this one a little bit. But I want to make sure for all of my new candle makers, if this is your first summer, that you're not feeling like I started out great with a bang, especially if you started in January, February or March, or you hit your moment during Easter. And then all of a sudden, the Facebook messengers and the Facebook ads have gone silent. My Etsy shop is slowing down. Like everything is literally slowing down. And you're trying to figure out why. So most of my veteran candle makers will likely agree. July is a slow month, y'all. July is slow. And I think it's a collection of holiday time. So you can finally vacation. Um, we're going to do a little bit of traveling. The weather itself doesn't always lend itself. Candles, for some reason, in most states, especially if you're in the southern states, are going to conjure up those thoughts of, you know, long evenings, fireplaces, coziness, family. So the fall, the winter are your kind of months. The spring will be a launching board for you. But you will learn what's going to be the most important activities for you to accomplish during the summer and what's not. Because I was in the same position after my first year. So I started pouring, remember, in November. And then when I came to that first summer, I wasn't sure if I should do farmer's markets or if online sales were going to keep going. And then all of a sudden, my online got really, really quiet. And this was the point when I kind of started researching. I reached out to people who have been pouring um, longer than I had and just asked a question like, what do you do during the summer? Um, and that particular year, we were having a really hot summer. So even the thought of shipping during the summer kind of made me nervous. And they were like, July is always slow. And honestly, July in the first week, second week of August, um, for us until school goes back, is pretty slow. And so what I've learned to use that time for is inventory is one. If you haven't created a spreadsheet, if you haven't come up with a system on how to track what is occurring, what's not occurring, this is the time for you to stop and make that moment. If you haven't had a chance to take product photos, that's another one that's really big. So if you haven't had a chance to update your product photos on your website, now is the time to get that done. 
If you've been thinking about moving into a vendor space, a retail space of any kind, now is the time to look at those leases because what you're gearing up for actually as a business, remember I said when you walk in Hobby Lobby, if you look at the very top of those shelves, you're going to notice there are pumpkins up there. If yours are not already out, um, we have a couple of Hobby Lobbies. The Christmas section is already out and popping and it throws everyone else off, but that's for you. You are that crafter that they are throwing that hint. If you have not picked your fall scents, your fall fragrances, um, because when September rolls around, that pumpkin cheesecake is already in full effect. You want to make sure that you have those candles ready to go. If you're going to do that spice, the lattes, the cinnamons, the chives, you've got to be careful because by the time you start thinking about fall fragrances, they're gone. So now is the time when you want to decide, are you going to add fragrances to your line? Are there some fragrances that you know you're going to actually take out of circulation for a little bit? And this is kind of the technique that I've used before. I have some fragrances that are extremely popular during the summertime. So when you think about all of your cherry like that, you're going to notice that they get really, really popular. Um, I have some island scents that are loved, but in August, they start to taper off. So what I do is I call those my selective pours. I do them in collections because when you say collections, most of your customers are going to think, I'm going to get this for a little while, but I know it's not going to be a permanent set. Anything that I pour permanently, right now I have about 20 fragrances that are my standard line. They're called my everyday collection. My everyday collection is going to be at every single retail spot that you see BCJ decor. So when you walk in and you see BCJ somewhere on the wall, I usually have somewhere between 16 to 20 of those, I think it's 16 to 21 of those everyday collection pieces. And depending on where I am, sometimes you'll notice some parts of the everyday collection sell and some of them do not. The good thing is those are normally the fragrances you pour the most of up front. So when people ask, well, how many candles should I keep in my inventory? I normally keep three of each fragrance. I will also sometimes um, decide to only pour the eight ounce, even though I may offer it as a four ounce or a wax melt. So I will go in, pour three eight ounces. That's what I take my product photos of. Or if I'm going to do product photos of just my four ounces at that point, that's what I will do product photos of. And that's what I post first. So from there, I at least have some representation of that scent overall. Y'all have to excuse me. I'm over here trying to wick um, because it's time for me to fill that second location because restocking is going to be another one. Now, here's another thing to kind of think of. How many scents will you add to your fall fragrance list? So if you think about it, most collections, you want to have a high, a middle, and a low note. And when we're thinking about candle makers, normally what my newbies are kind of thinking, I want something that is sweet, something that's relaxing, kind of mellow or clean in the middle, and something that's going to have that masculine kind of husk to it. Guys, during the wintertime, do not forget those masculine scents. So I know for us, a lot of suppliers, if you are lucky enough to be close to one, they're allowing appointments to actually go into the showroom. This is a good one because honestly, for me personally, I haven't smelled a new fragrance prior to purchasing in over a year, easily in over a year and some change. And so there are a couple of scents I've seen online that I know I definitely want to um, kind of kind of try out. But the other thing is normally if I haven't used a fragrance before, I'm the kind that will buy the two ounce bottle, give it a try, and then I give myself enough time to be able to go back to be able to order that fragrance if I'm really happy with it. But if I'm able to make an appointment and go into the distributor themselves, it kind of saves you a trip and a step because I can stand there and decide, is this something that I want to add as well? Here's another one. I have quite a few beginners that have been doing white candles only. And a few of you have kind of played with the idea of, do I want to add color to my particular line? And what I tell a lot of people um, when it comes to adding color and knowing exactly what you want to do, 
the, that's when I use one of my testers. So in the beginning, um, I've always played with color. I played with color from the very beginning because I felt like if I walk past a white display, which I have seen several, especially this past weekend, that were absolutely amazing with the packaging, y'all. Like there are some ladies in the new boutique who are coming with it on that packaging. But what I noticed is, and I heard a customer say it as well, in the three booths that I walked by in the same location where I'm located, all their candles had one thing in common. Though their packaging on one was black and gold, another one was rose gold, another one had this beautiful turquoise vessel, all their candles were white. And I had an older um, customer walk by and she was like, you know, the first thing I noticed is it made me look over because it reminded me of candy. And I couldn't figure out what it was, if it was candy, if it was something else. And I tried to make my booth where the middle section is left empty on purpose. Most booths are going to fill up that entire space. And we'll go into that one too. And I'll tell you the reason why I leave that front area empty. But she was like, it was the colors that called me over. And I've noticed the more extravagant I become with embeds, with decorations, with colors, the more intrigued people are to kind of figure out what it is. So that's another one that I've been putting on the list. Here's something else. When you go and pick up your fall fragrances, by the end of this week, I'm gonna need y'all to go ahead and put that order in. Fall fragrances, people. By the end of this week, me and y'all together. I'm putting my order in probably today. So put it in. I want you to also start looking at a couple of Christmas fragrances. Now, if you were pouring on last year, Here's something I want to ask you to do. Before you purchase a new fragrance oil, come on, veterans. Y'all already know how this goes. Before you purchase any new fragrance oils, I want you to stop, pause, and go back to the fragrance oils you currently have and pull out those from last season because you have some. I've still got some, some pumpkin something laying around. I have a couple of Christmas and Douglas firs, Christmas memories and traditions, all of those seasonal fragrances that you already have on hand, you need to get rid of them. If not, you already know, it's kind of like buying shoes, clothes, or anything else. You're gonna go out, you're gonna buy something new, you get really excited about it, and that bottle of fragrance that you already have anyway is gonna sit there. So now all of a sudden, that fragrance section is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, which brings me to this question. Y'all see these little roller carts back here, right? Ignore how messy they are. Roller carts came from Ikea. They're the same ones you can find at Michael's. They put them on sale um, pretty often. But I looked up and got these, I think for like $20 at Ikea. They were really, really easy to put together. Extremely sturdy. They have the holes at the bottom so nothing collects. Everything can just fall to the floor, clean the tile, and you're done, right? Here's a reason that I have limited my collection to two roller carts. And honestly, when it comes to fragrance oils, only two of the six shelves are allowed for fragrance oils. And this is what I told myself. I may fall in love with a lot of fragrances, which happens on a regular basis all the time. But the other thing that I have to keep in mind is I've got to use all of those fragrances. So as a business person, you've got to keep in the back of your mind as excited as you may be to try something new because it is amazing. You cannot keep ignoring what you currently have on hand because if you have not used it, think about it. That's your money that's sitting there staring at you. You don't want to leave any money, any materials unused. If you have purchased vessels, for example, a vessel shortage has been huge. I actually picked up a couple of vessels a few months ago because I was desperate, y'all, for four ounces, four ounce jars. Could not find a four ounce jelly jar back in February um, to save my life and had just gotten a restock order and a personal order for only four ounce jars, which that's how it is. If you have jars in stock, nobody wants them. Nobody orders them. Nobody thinks about them. But as soon as you say, I am down to my last case, all of a sudden... I look up and I have an order, four cases of four ounces in three different fragrances. Crushed, ended up changing jars, did not like the jar, didn't like how the jar looked, 
but showed it to the client. They were fine with it, switched up the product, created a special label for that limited edition um, candle, and I was able to finish up the order. The only problem was at the end, I'm still stuck with about four cases, and I think there are 24 jars per case of this four ounce jar that I really don't like. And this is where some of those D-stash groups come from. Sometimes you order something because you have to, but it's not your favorite. And when it's not your favorite, it kind of shows. What I've thought about this though, is do I want to turn those into either wickless candles, into body scrub holders, like use them as body scrub vessels, which is another thought, or create a unique bath salt that accommodates the candle in a gift set and to put that up. You've got to start thinking that we're getting to the point of gift giving. And so the goal for me personally this year is I want to work with small businesses and be able to provide them and their employees with some type of gift. And that gift won't always just be candle related because most of you guys have other products in your shop. So how can you put those together to create a nice gift basket that you can present to any business or place their logo on it, for example? Those are good ways for you to get those larger orders that will be needed around the holiday time. And guess what? Most businesses, somewhere between July and mid-September, that's when they're going to be putting in those custom Christmas orders. So this is when you are tightening up on packaging, labeling, and all that other greatness. And I know for me, the other thing I had to definitely um, start hunting down was shipping boxes that fit my newer products. Because some of my newer jars are larger than the boxes that I started out with. So the cute little box that I love so much with all my little stickers and paper, it doesn't work for some of my custom candles. So since um, wax, if you're thinking about switching up wax, you're not happy still with your hot throw or cold throw, now is the time. If you are only doing markets right now, I know a lot of people have found a farmer's market and y'all know I love markets. Um, and primarily that's where your business is coming from. So you're doing a market either monthly or bi-weekly or whatever. This is also a good time for you to start surveying those customers that are coming to your booth and just ask them, hey, what are some things that remind you of fall? Because what you're looking for are what are those notes, those hints, those events that make you think of that particular season? Remember, even as a candle maker, there are candle makers that only pour scents that they like. They do. They only pour things that they would enjoy in their home. And then there are other candle makers that they pour for their clients. They pour with their clients and their customers like. And what I'm always trying to do is to build a relationship where you are a repeat long-term client. I want that client or customer that's walking through the door and that understands where my line is going. All right. So y'all don't hesitate. Don't fall back on it. Organize yourself update your photos. Um, for me, photo updating is always one of those moments. You've got to have the product on hand, number one. You want your background to be as, as clean and as honestly as blank of a canvas sometimes as possible because a lot of people will trail off to everything else in your photo. So let's say, for example, you have your candle front and center that's sitting next to a nice little vase that has a snuffer and some snips in front of it. I've had people that ask about every other item in the picture but the candle. So remember, that candle is supposed to be front, center, and body. If you are in the picture, your hand in the picture with that candle in it is much more important than a full frontal of you in every single product photo area. So they're looking for the scent. Here's something else I noticed. I went to a couple of websites um, for a few small businesses over the weekend. And number one, I appreciate those that reach out and just want a fresh eye. Y'all, th thank you. It's, it's just no other way to say it. Because your websites give me inspiration, they give me ideas, and I promise you, I'm going to come back with some questions. Because I do not know it all, especially when it comes to websites. But going in and having somebody go in as a client, as a customer, to kind of look at it with a fresh set of eyes is a really, really good idea. And if you're able to do it with somebody who you know, most of us have that candidly honest person. You want to start with those who are closest to you, but then start to branch out and kind of get a feel. 
The other thing is when you post your website, even within this group, because there are so many of us that are more than willing to reach out. Remember when you receive that feedback, hey, you know, everything's looking good. You may want to think about this. That's where the true feedback is starting for you as a business person. Do I need to add lighting? Is it overexposed? Do I need to move my product center? Do I need to rearrange my labeling? For a lot of us, you will spend a lot of time on a label and it aesthetically looks good when it's printed flat on paper. You place it on the candle, you finally start doing product photos and guys, it disappears. Like it makes you feel as though all the work that you put into that label just doesn't exist. Don't get frustrated with that. It happens to a lot of people. Most of us, we did not go to photography school. Most of us did not do marketing and branding. So you are learning as you go. The biggest thing is to remain flexible and be careful at every step where you decide to go ahead and really, really invest not only your, your money, but also your time. Because there are moments when I have printed a label, loved the label, took a photograph, went back after I walked away from the project and realized that label was not conveying anything. Like it didn't, it didn't push out anything. And so for me, it's one of the main reasons why I've always trumped back to simplicity because I'm trying to really pick what's going to be most important um, for my particular brand. Last but not least, y'all, because I'm going to try not to make this one too long. <sighs> Let's talk about this spirit of relaunching because this is a big one. This is a really, really big one. I've seen a lot of comments of people that, as I said earlier, perhaps launched in January, had a really good initial launch, um, did a events, did a grand opening, um, took in nice size orders, and then that might have been in January. And by March, they had to take a break and step away. Or by April, right after Easter, they had to step away. And so for April, May, and half of June, it's been pretty silent. Or you launched, sold out of product, and then all of a sudden you had to shut down your website completely because you were out of everything that was listed on the website. Now that you want to come back, because that's what you're thinking in your mind, okay, it's time for me to, you know, get, get, get back on the horse, you know, jump back in the game, I'm ready. Now you want to relaunch and you feel the need to rebrand yourself. Let's talk about this. This is a couple of reasons in there. Y'all know good country girl. I want you to be careful. As long as I've been a teacher. And for me, this is going into my 16th year. I'm going to share something with you that I share with my students and I have to share with myself on a regular basis. The more I keep starting from scratch the longer it takes me to feel accomplished, the longer it takes me to get back to where I started, and the longer it takes you to reach that ultimate goal. Sometimes the relaunch and sometimes the rebrand is not only not needed, but it's a crutch because it gives you more time to feel as though after the next few weeks, I'll be ready. Guess what? You won't be. I think about business the same way I think about parenting. When I hear younger couples say, oh, you know, we're going to wait for the perfect moment before we buy a house. We're going to wait for the perfect moment before we have our first kid. We're going to wait for the perfect moment. And then you realize there are no perfect moments. There really aren't. You're going to get to a point where months have gone by and you're still sitting there. Because if I was to ask you for your relaunch, what is your relaunch day? or date, 99% of the time, the person does not have an answer for me. If I ask you on what day will you officially relaunch? 90, mm, 95% of the time, they can't tell me. And what happens whenever you don't put a date in your mind, it remains open in your spirit. And it's not like that. If you stepped away for a month or two and now you're back, Pour a new scent, introduce it in all of your social media, and pick up your collection where you left off. No hoopla, no, if this is creative sense, I've been gone for about two months. I had a really good um, following prior to leaving. 
I'm going to sit down and every customer that I have previously collected in their information, their email from, every single previous customer is going to receive a notice that we are back with new fragrances. And notice I didn't say we're back after a vacation. We're back after. You don't have to share that. In small business, we tend to be very personal. And that's what people love about us. But you also have to draw that line on what you share and what you do not share about your particular business. Introduce a new fragrance or create you a nice little announcement, not only on your website, but on all of your social media. I want you to go through and pick two or three fall fragrances that you know you're going to pour um, for next month. Go ahead and make a test candle. And then you're going to create photos from those tests. And for three days in a row, you're going to announce one of those new fragrances. You can do five. You can do ten. It's up to you. You don't have to relaunch. Because to relaunch makes it seem as though either there was a misorganization going on or you're under new management. Kind of gives you one of those feels. And it's possible. But everybody doesn't have to know. Think about that. Here's another one. What do you say if you are on your third rebranding in the first year? All businesses, probably 90% or more of businesses, will rebrand at one point or another. I can tell you this. Has my label changed over time? Yes. The fonts that are used, have they changed over time? Absolutely. Have my jars changed over time? Yes. And guys, I've only been pouring candles now. Um, oh gosh, it's almost three years. So coming up on three years. In that time, have I done an official rebranding? No. My name did not change. Um, how my company represented itself overall did not change. Have I added products to my line? Absolutely but it did not require me to do a full rebrand. Because when you say rebrand, everything from your shirts to your business card, to your logos, your tissue paper, some of you have customized boxes. What you're making me feel as though is that you're about to go back and redo all of that, all of that. So everything that it took you months, and some of you guys were in the branding, testing, um, feedback, stage of business for over six months. I've seen a couple of people who were in that stage for about a year and it shows like everyone is not that learn as I go kind of person. Some people really want to have a little backup, a little insurance. And so they're really big on the research department. And so that's the other thing that I've noticed. Well, if you're going to rebrand, you're thinking about redoing all of that. Here's another one. If you're rebranding, have you thought about your mission statement? Has it changed? Has your goal for your business, have the focus of your business, has the way in which your business serves its clients changed? Because if you're rebranding, there's a reason and there's a purpose. A lot of us think rebranding is just a sticker. It's just a package. It's just a vessel. And it's not. Rebranding for a lot of businesses is an indicator of growth. You're not where you started. Your ideals are not the same. And at this point, you feel as though you've elevated everything to a point where every product now needs to be reflective of where you are now. If you've been pouring candles for three months, unless you started with an extremely simple layout, it's probably not where you are. A lot of us go back to the relaunch and some of us even go so far as a rebranding because we haven't gotten to the point where we feel confident enough to put that product out there. A lot of you guys have created wonderful products. For many of you, it's not the candle. It's not even the vessel. It's not even the, the overall packaging. For a lot of people where their insecurity comes in is that little part on the front of that jar, that label, it may not be as cute as the candle maker right next to you. And that's what's getting you. It's little things. It's little things that where you are looking for those areas of perfection. Guys, it's not necessary. I promise you, your brand will speak for itself. I want you to really stop and ask yourself, what is my mission? And what is the purpose that drives me to do this? 
day in and day out because candle making is a very repetitious industry. What excites me? Because those are the things that I'm putting into my collection. Those are the things from my personality that make me different from everybody else. What questions should I ask that I have not asked yet? That's another one. And some of us have those questions and we haven't put them out there. Put them out there and see what happens. Last but not least, and I'll tell you two things. I had a young lady reach out to me and she's been really excited about her product for quite some time. But the problem was she's moved to a new area. Family is really, really small, but she didn't feel comfortable or feel as though she had anyone to send her product to to test it out. And I told you guys, and we had mentioned before, one of the things that I do is when I have a new product, I will ship it to a friend that's a couple of states away to kind of see how it looks when it arrives and also get feedback from somebody who's not in my general area. When you're asking your testers to use your product, you want to make sure they're using it in different rooms. Are you going to burn it first in the bathroom? Small area, more confined, quicker hot throw. Are you going to use it in a bedroom? Are you going to use it in a living room? How many square feet roughly do you think that area would be? Those are the things that you're looking for. So those are the things you're kind of paying attention to. And so I told her, I said, hey, if you want, I'll send you a product. You send me a product, test it out, and let me know your opinion. Guys, one of the best burning candles that I have experienced is the one that I got the other day. When I tell you fragrant in my bedroom within 20 minutes, there. Have actually burned at this point mm, over 20 hours and have not even used a quarter of the candle. There. Probably one of the only things I would look at was the labeling. That's it. Other than that, their product is ready. That young lady whose confidence actually should be out the roof because her product is awesome, was caught up in the smaller things because confidence, it's that nervousness, it's the fear that someone won't be pleased, especially when it's a product that you've made because it feels like a little baby for you, especially if people come for it. Y'all, it's nerve wracking. I still get nervous when I send out products. I always have, and I probably always will. And I think it's a good thing. It's the same way every year I get nervous before I go teach. And I've been doing it for years at this point, overall. Decades at this point, overall. But there's always this nervousness because there's that little voice that says, are you ready? Should you do it now or should you wait? Like I've literally packed boxes with sweat dripping because... I am so, so nervous about what that person is going to say. And I've had to learn and tell myself it's good enough because it was good enough when I burned it. I loved it. It's more than good enough because it represents my business name. All right. Now, last question that people had asked about was costs that are involved with opening a new storefront. I'm actually going to package these last four, make a little eye contact. So if you are still working on the side over there, get it, y'all. I feel it. I've only got one more case to wick. And then I'll at least have a good little start. Let's talk about costs really quickly. Because I'm one of those that I appreciate people sharing, but I think we're... Not only as a community, we kind of fall short is people don't want to be honest about the money in the end. And that's the part, especially as a new person, especially someone who's trying to grow, that you want to know. And keep in mind, there are some veterans there that are just now reaching out to retail. I know a, a guy, actually, that he's been pouring candles for about three years. Like he's three and a half years in the game. He's just now thinking about doing retail because he's never had to do it really before. And now he wants to see what that would look like overall for his product, how he will be able to reach a different crowd. And that crowd is going to be based on the zip code that you select. All right. So, for example, I chose a space. I chose a booth. My cheapest booth rental, guys, has gone anywhere from 250 
to 360, 370 monthly. All right. So this is a retail booth. It's your job to come in. I started with a six by 10 space. I'm now in a six by 14 space. My goal is actually to get up to a 12 by 20 space in this location because there are some ladies that are rocking it, right? So you have your monthly rent. That's something you've got to plan for no matter what. I'm the kind of person, if I sign a six month or a 12 month contract, I like to be able to take at least half of the money that I know will be due for rent and put it to the side before I ever sign that dotted line. Be very mindful before you sign any lease, any contract. If anything comes up, illnesses, car breaks down, house needs something, you still have that bill, y'all, just like the electric bill, the water bill that's hanging over your business. So at least if you go in with a cushion, it's one of the things to think of. Do they ask you for proof of insurance, EIN? The answer is no. Many of them do not. So most of your retail spaces will actually... Give you a space, of course, for your product. You go in with a clean slate. You put in all of your display, all of your products. You will label it. You will place it into a system. It creates a barcode because that's how you're able to garner your inventory. So you know exactly what's in the store and what's not. And we'll talk about deep down retail inventory. We can do that one on the next one because I have not been a champion of that one. Now... What the store is responsible for is, number one, reducing the possibility of threat. I mean, of theft is going to be one of them. They have people that will walk around to your booth. They're going to dust things off, make sure they're on the shelf properly. Um, if there's an uh, issue with a the customer, they will call you and see if they can get some kind of resolution going. If you are out of town, for example, you can actually ship your product down. They charge you a fee and they will stock that product for you on the shelf and then send you a picture to, for your final approval. So all of that is what's going on the vendor space itself. Now, what did it take this past weekend for me to even move into that retail space? Well, my retail space is almost four hours from me. Four hours, okay? So this is the first time I've gone more than an hour out, especially in retail, because it's something that you visit at least monthly. Bi-weekly, monthly is what you need to plan on. So we're gonna get to know this area pretty well. I also had to factor in that moving in, I needed help. So I had to bring in contract workers. I've talked about it before. If you have older kids or kids, honestly, that are 10 and up, you may want to think about, or seven and up, you may want to think about making them your employees. So they do an hourly um, wage. They log in through Square. So I have proof of their time. And then I also cut them a check as well. So I hired two employees. I needed one that was old enough to drive, drive a U-Haul truck. And I also need people to help me put shelves together. There's a limit to what you will be able to accomplish by yourself. And I knew for me, I want this to be a short two-day kind of turnaround moment. All right. So we stayed overnight. I had to pay for a hotel room. If you are out of town, you got to eat. So I went in and had to budget for meals as well. And then, of course, you have fuel, you have taxes that go along with that truck. Total work time within the space itself was about seven hours. So we did five, two hours the first day when we made it down, dropped off all the product, just to make sure that nothing melted, um, get a feel for the overall space location, kind of look at your neighbor's booths and get a feel for the aesthetic of the store. Which if you've ever been into a painted tree, um, there are a couple of others. Uh, the aesthetic for each one, each retail space is going to be a little bit different. But the painted tree kind of reminds you of like a home goods or the Target, Magnolia section. You know, those areas, those build outs of some of those booths can be really, really elaborate. So you want to bring your A game. You want to make sure you step up and your little booth is not looking lonely. Mine looks a little lonely, but that's okay. Because I'm going to tell you about this little, this little emptiness space, y'all. So... Got everything in. We spent about seven, maybe eight hours total over the course of two days. We're all ready to go. Snap a couple little photos because at this point, no personal photos are coming out. In a perfect world, I probably would have stayed an extra day, came back the next morning, made sure everything was good, rearranged, cute little outfit with your business logo shirt, and then taking a picture in front of it, which is what I'll actually do when I go back downstairs. And so 
you're sitting here and you're kind of thinking to yourself, you know, what else do I need to get done? Well, you want to check off the boxes. And what I forgot to do was enter all my inventory into the system. And so I didn't realize that though all my products were stickered, they weren't properly barcoded. And I had to definitely bounce back. Overall, between the purchasing of the display, um, the rent, paying my employees, um, travel, gas, roughly my expenses for this particular open and launch was about $1,100. So that's $1,100 of just getting the product down there to be ready for a soft launch. And they will do a grand opening on the 17th of the month still. Before you take the leap... You do not want to have that money sitting where that thousand dollars, instead of it being for this is going to be a retail opening, you can't use the money that you would have used for your wax, your fragrance oils. Because the one thing you don't want to do in retail is open a booth and then all of a sudden your booth literally is almost closed because you're out of inventory. You've got to be mindful of that. So before I left, the other thing I was thinking of, all right, I've gone through and guys, I poured 321 products in three days. I know for some people that's like a one day event, but for me, it was fast and furious because that was from beginning of the process to the end. So from wicking the jar to the part where I was able to put the film on top and place all of my labeling accordingly, three days, 321 products. And if you look at the photos that I posted um, in the group and on my page as well, that little space still does not look full. That is 321 products. So when you walk up to a booth and you see three micro shelves and one table, for some people, it's taking days for them to pump that out. And it depends also on how many products you have. You're not sure what's going to sell in that area and what won't. So I want to offer a variety, but I also want to have a particular customer in mind because that will always allow me to limit myself. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, we can definitely do a deeper breakdown, kind of talk about some retail, send me some questions. If you have a product that you want me to try or if you want to do a product swap, definitely reach out to me. Um, you guys can hit me up on Messenger or... BCJ Decor, find me on Facebook. I do have a business page as well. So like, join, ask away, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.